everyone who's joined, and I'm sure there'll be more who will be joining as we progress this afternoon to this next edition of our department's 150th seminar series. This seminar is titled Reimagining Mental Health Care, the Legacy of Paul Farmer. I'd like to start with some preliminary remarks before I introduce what we plan uh, for this seminar and also then introduce my fellow panelists. The world is experiencing a mental health crisis, and I think all of you are very familiar with the nature of that crisis. This crisis disproportionately affects those who are already on the margins of society. From low-income groups and LGBTQ plus persons to those who have been exposed to the traumas of war and intimate partner violence. Our young people, arguably our greatest human asset, are especially threatened as evocatively profiled in last Sunday's New York Times. This crisis is reflected in many ways, but the key metrics that many use are those of the prevalence of mental illness, substance use problems, and self-harm. Based on these metrics, the situation was worsening in most countries for the two decades even before the pandemic. Of course, as we now know, the pandemic has only added more fuel to this fire. Now, it's, 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 a lot of people have speculated for the causes of this crisis, and I don't believe we have a definitive answer, and it's quite likely there will be a complex array of reasons. In my mind, almost certainly that includes the increase in risk factors alongside the disappearance or reduction in protective factors. Social medicine, one of the core disciplines of our department, is the beating heart of global mental health for there is no human ailment which is as inseparably intertwined with social conditions as mental illness. We now know that adversities in one's social world, especially in the early years of our life, contribute immensely to the risk of mental illness. And adversities in our social world are amongst the most damaging consequences of mental illness. Moreover, as I have observed as a clinician over the course of working in both wealthy and resor less resourced countries, Unlike almost any other human ailment, virtually all the countries that I have worked in have singularly failed to address the vicious cycle between social adversities and poor mental health. No one can question that many of these pernicious social factors have worsened in the past decade, not least those which are fueled by climate change. But there's also at the same time, the dramatic erosion of protective factors, especially those that we witness through the damage to social connectedness and social capital, for example, through hateful polarization, the loss of trust in the state, and economic policies leading to rising inequality. This rise is compounded, of course, by the failure to care for people with mental illness. Indeed, as Storm Insel, the former chief of the NIMH, argues in his fantastic recent book, Healing, at the heart of the mental health crisis is the crisis of care. Every metric, as Storm says, reflecting poor mental health has worsened despite the US spending more on mental health care than for any other health condition, which I have to admit was a surprise to me, enjoying more mental health resources per capita, particularly specialist human resources than any other country and spending more than $20 billion on research to address the mental health crisis under his stewardship. This is of course in stark contrast to the progress that we see in virtually every other domain of medicine. To most people, it is plainly evident that this crisis must require us to interrogate the core assumptions underlying our understanding of the nature of mental health problems and the architecture of the mental health care delivery system. At the heart of this interrogation is the biomedical framing of mental disorders. Faculty in this department have been doing exactly this for over half a century, and critical scholarly publication from Arthur Kleinman's Patients and Healers in the Context of Culture in 1980 to the World Mental Health Report in 1995 have set the foundations of reframing mental health as a global development issue, which needs a different discourse from that which has dominated the rest of medicine. That was the goal of this event, 
which was planned months ago before our department and our commu community was dealt a grievous blow in the passing of our much beloved and celebrated chair, Paul Farmer. My panelists and I felt that today's conversations could be reframed by engaging in some of the ideas that Paul championed, by examining how we can address the challenge of mental health problems through the lens of these ideas, from his elaboration of structural violence as a key driver of poor health, to the unjust nature of the disparities in access to quality healthcare, which affected those who were already disadvantaged and shorn of power and agency. Some years ago, I have one memorable writing, co-writing uh, uh, experience with Paul when we wrote a piece in The Lancet on the moral foundations of global mental health care in the context of the egregious fact that people with severe mental disorders died 20 years earlier than others in their communities. And this is in wealthy countries, in less well-resourced countries that life expectancy gap can be as much as 30 to 40 years. And this is of course, not because these disorders are in and of themselves lethal conditions, but almost entirely because of a toxic combination of overwhelming social determinants and poor quality care. Paul also championed the role of privileged medical schools such as ours as platforms for social change and building capacity in less privileged institutions and the need for a research mission to always be twinned with a commitment to build services and above all for actions aimed at prevention to always be accompanied by actions aimed at care. Indeed, he unstintingly argued for the idea that everyone, rich and poor, in power, as well as those of the margins were entitled to enjoy the entire benefits of the tremendous advances emerging from biomedical science. So friends, today I will engage in a conversation with five of my amazing colleagues, all faculty in our department, some of whom were Paul's mentors and others who were his mentees and all of whom who have worked closely with Paul for decades. Each of my colleagues will share an aspect of their work which exemplifies the central elements of our discussion today. How should we reimagine mental health care in ways which reflect the legacy of Paul Farmer's scholarship and his contributions to global health and social medicine? What I propose to do is that I will invite each of my colleagues to speak in turn. And after, all the, after the remarks from all the panelists, we will then open up for a discussion and invite you, the audience, to pose questions, please use the Q&A box in your Zoom window, and I'll make sure I'll try and attend to as many of those questions as possible. So with that, I'd like to now turn to the first of our panelists and invite Arthur Kleinman to speak. Arthur, over to you. Thank you, Vikram. Well, it's a pleasure to be on this panel. And um, as the oldest panelist, I'll draw on my age to um, frame uh, how I see Paul in the context of global mental health. So what you should know is that 1981, in the second letter that I received from Paul when he was a sophomore at Duke University, um, he told, informed me that he was going to Paris to work with Georges Devereaux, a noted psychoanalyst, on cultural psychoanalysis. So Paul moved pretty far in the course of his career from his early interest in cultural psychoanalysis. And maybe I take as, as maybe my leading effect as a mentor was to drive him out of the mental health field into infectious diseases. Um, I think more seriously that what Paul represented for me and for the mental health field was the importance of beginning far outside the context of the hospital, the clinic, the asylum, even the home, to recognize the broad sources of social suffering and their consequences for mental health. I think that all of us share that awareness that um, uh, Paul's insistence that we looked at poverty deep poverty, the grinding quality of poverty, at malnutrition, at the um, 
at lives bearing the burdens of infectious diseases, epidemics, um, uh, all the pressures and difficulties that made the poorest of the world so wretched as, um, as uh, uh, Paul himself recognized and as Franz Fanon insisted. That's one of the effects I think that Paul uh, gave us. And you can see that in the, in the 1995 World Mental Health Report, which focused on um, things that were not at the time regarded as central to mental health, which had a more of a biomedical epidemiological figuring. So for example, the insistence in the 1995 World Mental Health Report on the clustering, recognizing the clustering of violence, suicide, depression, substance abuse in uh, poor, violent in the city settings. And therefore the recognition that no single mental health intervention was going to be able to be effective until social conditions were adequately addressed. Or Paul's um, insistence on scarcity, on scarcity, uh, that um, the scarcity model of public health was not how people should be treated around the world. That is, there was no scarcity if one pushed on governments and insisted that mental health be treated like any aspect, any other aspect of health. Um, accompaniment and the emphasis that we I'm sure we'll hear from Vikram himself on um, uh, local health workers working together with the families and with the mentally ill. But for me actually um, right now, it's a different uh, dimension that uh, Paul's influence uh, 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 has its principal effect. I have a project right now in China called Social Technology for Global Aging and Elder Care. And in that project, we are trying to figure out ways that social focus and, a, um, and technological focus can come together to provide interventions that can assist people and families and communities with dementia. Um, Paul very much had in mind the idea that poor communities in Haiti in Rwanda, in the United States, elsewhere in Africa, in Latin America, throughout the world, deserved high quality, but also, if necessary, high technology interventions. And that those technology, technological interventions could be given even in poor circumstances, if again, the scarcity model was overcome and sufficient funds were raised to address uh, these problems. So in the dementia area in, in China, particularly in marginalized and poor populations, we are looking at things like uh, rental centers that allow for uh, very low cost for um, things, uh, assisted technologies ranging from uh, wheelchairs to um, assisted technologies uh, with helping people who are in um, mental health difficulties and need, for example, smartphone apps or other assistance to be able to reach out for care or receive diagnoses or enter into the search for adequate interventions. I could go on and on with my own examples, but the inspiration for this, the inspiration came from the fact that Paul, originally my student, became my mentor, more than a mentor, became my image of what a, what a person should be and what a researcher should do. And I think that um, the fact that at the close of my life, I've emphasized uh, care, care for dementia, care for chronic illnesses, care for the elderly more broadly, and that care encompassing family care, self-care, 
and community care. All of that recognizes the, the iconic significance of Paul as a model for helping others, for repairing the world, for doing good in the world. We're focusing on mental health, but we could have organized this panel way beyond mental health, as everyone knows, to the broad stream of health. Paul's willingness to see mental health as part of that was extremely important for all of us on this panel. And, uh, and I think in the world, um, just as he did with cancer and chronic disorders more generally, to insist that global health was not just about infectious diseases and that indeed infectious diseases might have some significance, the modeling of care there for uh, mental health. Thank you. Thank you, Arthur. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm sure there are many points that you've raised that I'm going to circle back to. And I also invite my fellow panelists as well to use the chat function so that I can uh, I can see if there are any specific questions or follow up remarks you want to make after these uh, initial remarks. Let me now turn to Mary Jo Good uh, for her remarks. Thank you, Vikram. And uh, thank you all for joining. Um, we have um, many of our colleagues and friends are on the chat on, on, on the uh, uh, participant list. I wanted to start with the comment that Arthur made about uh, Paul inspiring uh, him and others. I felt that um, I would take these few minutes to look at what our department has given its life to and that is to train a great many people from around the world as well as in the US at the postdoctoral level, at the fellowship level, at uh, the MMSC level. I will speak a bit about the um, influence that Paul had as a figure on people who came from Indonesia and China to deal with issues of mental health. So Paul gave, Paul actually had a way of making young people who were in um, the medical field or in the mental health field to want to internalize his act style of uh, addressing the crises, the social crises, the social suffering, uh, the dimensions of, uh, of caring for people in terms of repairing the world. And it happened with, to be that uh, the Fogarty program, which started in 2000 because of Arthur's relationship on, and advice on the national level Fogarty program, Byron and I became the PIs, the grant writers, et cetera for a group of psychiatrists who came from mostly China, but also um, from Hong Kong, I guess, China, and who were beginning to think about how they could address the revolutionizing of mental health care. How could they aspire to a different kind of psychiatry and it came under a, one characteristic of these programs that got introduced in Hong Kong very early on when um, in 2000, when Erman Shah from Indonesia brought up the problem of freeing the mentally ill, freeing the mentally ill from their chains freeing them from restraints, freeing them from the filth, filthy places in which they were kept by family members and others, providing mental health care that would be located in the community. That then initiated a, in Indonesia, a whole program called Bebas Pasong unlocking the severely mentally ill. 
It was a kind of revolution in thinking that came about in the early 2000s and led to the various, uh, the various innovations in mental health care in both China and in Indonesia. One of the interesting things was not only the inspiration that Paul gave these young people who were our fellows and how they wanted to internalize certain kinds of aspects of Paul, of being Paul, like Arthur, Arthur spoke to that today. It's interesting, of being Paul, of being Paul in mental health. But he also introduced, I think, to the NIH and to USAID, a way of thinking about linking universities to the uh, healthcare system, to not only ministries of health, but to community mental health, to building programs with community health workers. In Indonesia, they call them Kotter, community health workers. Those who would be actually trained to provide mental health care for others and to bring people into a better system. And what we saw over the course of 20 years was changes in mental health law in both places, changes in the context of way people were thinking about how can we use the relationship to Harvard to actually help shape our policies at ex provincial level and then the community level. And also it led to a great deal of uh, training programs being developed for people at the local levels. Harvard trained people, training people at local levels in community mental health. Opening to families and communities themselves to speak about the difficulties of caring for the mentally ill for themselves. And one of the final programs that um, research programs that the um, Beijing people were doing was looking at what happens to the children of the mentally ill? How can they be cared for? So this kind of is inspiration was also built on the virtuous cycle that Paul envisioned when he first you know, spoke to us about trying to have PIH linked to our department, Harvard Medical School, and all of the you know, other places that PIH worked in the world, the sort of you know, the Brigham as well, the three pillar thing that went off to build um, the hospitals in Haiti and the hospitals and universities in Rwanda and the university that is coming up in Haiti as well as other things. So this is just a little bit of a sense of what that virtuous cycle has done in places like Indonesia and China. And um, one would not have predicted that. Paul visited Indonesia once in 2000 at a bioethics conference when we were establishing a bioethics and social medicine program, helping Gajamata get that going. He inspired people who were there um, with, uh, to the point where the medical students put out an agenda, a manifesto, how they were gonna revolutionize medical care for the poor <laughs> and for those who were left behind in, the, in their future and how they thought about training. And it would work because in China and Indonesia, you had robust primary care, community care, institutions, the Chinese ones like may have suffered and Arthur can talk speak later to that, but the, um, the Indonesian ones remained very strong and they were good, good uh, institutions to build these revolutions in uh, mental health care, right down to the village Cotter, who maybe still are concerned that they don't want to have someone in their family marry someone who's ill, but they are not any longer afraid to care for the mentally ill. 
That's it. Thank, Thank you very much, uh, Mary Jo. Uh, I, I think you, you brought up another very important component amongst many, many of the things that you mentioned about Paul's legacy to, 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 uh, to complement what Arthur said, uh, not only his commitment to care, but also his commitment to education. Uh, and building capacity in institutions uh, in less resourced parts of the world. And I'm sure we we'll hear more about that later on as we think about his vision about the role of universities and particularly uh, the one that, the very privileged one that we're all members of. Uh, let me now turn to Professor Byron Good, um, uh, who has also worked extensively in Indonesia and China and other parts of the world. Byron, the floor is yours. Thank you, Vikram, and uh, thank you, Arthur and Mary Jo, and look forward to hearing what Anne and Bepi also have to say. Um, I want to just start by saying something that I hadn't even noted in jotting down, which is that this gathering of people here, and there are others in the community, Stephanie could be a part of this group and others, um, the fact that that Paul created a kind of collaborative community so that each of us in this, in this frame and others have actually worked together at various times, have actually, so that, you know, in, in, in distinction from many sort of, from many departments, the fact that there is the kind of collaboration across fields, across disciplines, but in particular, the kind of group, the grouping that we see here for us today really came out of Paul's vision. And so he has built communities like that in the area of, of uh, global surgery. He has built programs like that in, in, in areas and always fostered the coming together and the collaboration. So as Mary Jo was talking about, um, was talking about the training programs, I think of Arthur's commitment from the very beginning to making training a part of this program and, and actually including Paul in that when he um, when we had the uh, uh, the uh, early programs of, of, of the NIMH program um, his that Arthur for instance was was the person the reason Mary Jo and I were the head were the primary, PI, was a PI on a Fogarty grant for China of all things was because Arthur was on the board that launched that, that made, that brought mental health into an area that had been previously focused almost exclusively on, on infectious diseases. And so this building of, of, of bringing people together was, a, was really a very special talent that makes this department feel very different than some other departments that uh, some of us belong to. And simply, um, you know, I think it, it, it was a commitment on his part um, to do that. Now, let me just say a, a, a couple of additional words about the, and, and so let me just say, I totally agree with what Mary Jo has said about Paul's, not only his commitment, but, um, to commitment to training programs and bringing people to Harvard, knowing that it would benefit them from here and there around the world. And that included the China program. Um, and to say that, you know, the, the original theme, Vikram, of this program, of this discussion today, focusing on the difference it makes to place mental health in the context of social medicine, I think in those training programs, when one sees what those who came and studied with Arthur and Mary Jo and with me from, the, from Shanghai and Beijing, to see the kind of programs that they went off and launched, to see them doing explicitly evaluations of, of, of uh, programs in, um, in, in, of, of new legislation in China to see them actually focusing on issues of, of policy, knowing full well that if they actually studied neuroscience, it would be better for their advancement within the Chinese system. And that it was the very fact people would say, we're sending our young people to Harvard to open their minds. And, to, and the fact that it was in a department of social medicine uh, made those people even those who went on to do 
really advanced clinical research of various kinds on issues of psychosis, et cetera. But I think of all of the topics that, that people worked on, 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 on studying the problems of primary health care services and of depression in primary health care in which they discovered it was almost entirely about elders, exactly the, the population Arthur is now working on. So I just think that embedding these training programs in a department of, of social medicine has had a, a quite profound influence on those persons, those individuals, and on the institutions um, that they lead. Now, Vikram mentioned um, Paul's deep commitment to linking of research with, with, with practice. And you know, we've all heard at one time or another Paul say that he is not creating a department that's aimed at doing research and then hoping someone someday makes use of it, but that our task in a department of global health and social medicine should be to take on the major global health problems um, of our time and both generate knowledge while doing so and also develop the kind of knowledge necessary for actually carrying those pro programs forward. And I think that has both influenced the whole community uh, represented in, in this meeting today, but for instance, in our own work. So I would say when, when Mary Jo and I first started going on an intensive way to Indonesia, and I started doing research in particular on psychotic illness, I was very interested in documenting what was going on. And then after some years of that, um, we got, well, we were called to Aceh in a sense that in that there was the great tsunami that killed 300,000 people along the coast of one of the small provinces of, uh, of Indonesia on the northern tip of the island of Sumatra. But of course, when we arrived there, we found what we knew at some level, but did not know deeply, which is that that was a, a, a province that was deeply engaged in a civil war. And that the, the International Organization for Migration basically said to us, look, the tsunami money will be like a tsunami. It will come, it will rise up and it'll disappear. But taking on the issues of the long-term effects of conflict in this society is also a commitment of IOM. And they invited us to join in that process. And we did that. We did that under their auspices in which they asked us to, um, exam to, to, um, to develop a program of psycho a, a psychosocial needs assessment, do it in a kind of formal epidemiological way, which we did. And I think at the end of it, having written some very important documents for IOM that, that really showed just the level of violence. So for instance, we were the first people in this research to say that in high, high conflict areas, up to 80% of people had to flee their home 80% of the adults had to flee their homes at some time because of, because of, the, because of the violence. That 25% of men reported having been tortured. That 40% of adults told us that someone in their family had died and that 8% of women had husbands who were killed in that violence. Now that took us to the very heart of what is social medicine, of course. It was also took us to the heart of like really dealing with the human nature of violence and the, and the capability of organized violence of the kind. And then at the end of it, I think IOM was ready to say, now we've done our job. And our response was you have absolutely done not a damn thing except to document. And those persons who have told their stories to us deserve to receive care. And so 
I remember having screaming fights with IOM types saying, we have to respond to this. We are not simply going to have documented this. And I think that also came out of the, really the inspiration of Paul's work. And at the end of that project, we went back to Joke Jakarta, which is where we work mostly, and said, our having now documented what the, what the experience of being a psychotic person is like in the context of, of Javanese families, et cetera, and those who have been displaced or, uh, and are on the streets is also not enough. And so we were able to uh, bring in money from, uh, from a USAID program to begin really focusing attention on building mental health services and to asking with particular focus on psychotic illness, how can one in a very low resource setting develop recovery oriented mental health care? And that's been our commitment now really for, for the last uh, 12 years or so. And so we, it's work that we continue to do and that much of which is now being done by the young psychiatrists and psychologists with whom we've worked um, over those years. So I would just say that Paul's not only inspiration, but Paul's in a way giving permission to do what we all knew and all know is the right thing to be doing to not being simply um, exclusively flow focused on what kind of what kind of NIH grants that we can get to do this or that, but to actually going and doing the work that needs to be to be done and his supporting of us uh, to, to do those activities, I think has has really been um, and you know a, a, a has has supported us in what we've come to feel is the most important things that we do. And I would just say that, that Paul's commitment to, to developing the MMSC program, and I haven't looked at the participant list, but I'm sure many of our, of our MMSC uh, fellows and students have, um, are, are listening into this, was a deep commitment of Paul's. It was one of his deepest commitments to build this program and to build it in the kind of multidisciplinary social medicine based um, way that, that he perceived the world. And uh, I would just say that's another part of his legacy that we're quite committed uh, to carrying forward. So I think that's enough for me for this moment, Fikram, and thank you very much. Thank you very much, Byron. Um, you know, building on what we heard uh, from Mary Jo uh, and providing perhaps a more, uh, you know, more specific example of Paul's commitment to ensuring that we don't land up just doing research, but actually move the agenda towards um, practice that actually addresses some of the structural violence that is associated with mental health problems. I will circle back to all of you with a, with a question about how you think these experiences in, in the global context have influenced each of you, and of course, Anne is also an anthropologist, um, uh, in, in your view about uh, the, the nature of mental health problems in diverse cultural contexts. I do believe that perhaps more so than any other field of medicine that has been, uh, that has been one of the vexing questions that has often clouded the application of uh, uh, ideas around mental illness and mental health care that have emerged, say, for example, in, in the US or Western Europe, the relevance of these ideas and concepts to other parts of the world. And I will, I will just, I'll just flag that up because I'm gonna come back and ask you on your opinion about the relevance of those ideas, uh, to what extent they work, to what extent they have to be adapted. Or indeed, as some uh, in the field have argued, to what extent should they just be not even counted uh, and you start afresh. But Anne, I wanna now invite you, uh, the, the, the next generation as it were, uh, I think uh, it would be fair to say uh, that Byron, Arthur and Mary Jo would have been Arthur's mentors. <laughs> Uh, and probably fair to say, Anne, that you were probably one of his mentees and colleagues uh, for many decades. So I'd, invite, I'd like to invite Professor Anne Becker, uh, another member of our faculty, uh, to speak about her experiences. Well, um, thank you very much, Vikram. And yes, I'm proud to call myself a both a colleague and mentee of Paul's. Um, uh, it's a great honor to say that. Um, so let me start by thanking you, Vikram, for organizing this symposium and organizing us around 
um, this topic and also say what an honor and pleasure it is to join my colleagues to speak to reimagining global mental health today. And I think like my colleagues, I'm especially grateful for another opportunity to reflect on the astonishing legacy of our beloved colleague and mentor, Paul Farmer, and think together about how his intellectual imprimatur and example have influenced our work and the field of global mental health. And to start, I wanna note something I'd actually mentioned to my colleagues here um, on the panel already, um, that I my way of grieving and, and remembering Paul is uh, to reread his books. And if you could see my den around me, I've got you know many well-loved books marked up and, um, and, and I think you all will know what I mean when I say that his folksy style and trademark aphorisms lend themselves to conjuring up his voice. And it's very comforting to hear his voice and reading his words. But also I wanted to say that because his words and ideas feel very much part of the present and the future to me too. And, um, it, and I know everyone on this call knows this, but he was a wonderful teacher in that respect because his ideas are crystallized in such colorful and memorable ways and because they're also so layered and in a sense timeless and endlessly renewable. So I, I, the concept I would like to speak about um, in relation to my work and, and in relation to this exercise of reimagining global mental health with the benefit of Paul's legacy is the multi-layered construct of accompaniment. And I do realize that many of you attending the seminar today are veteran practitioners of accompaniment and even thought leaders in architecting how it has been so successfully deployed in the context of global health delivery writ large. And if you are one of those people, you will recognize that the brilliance of this construct is how useful it is. And I believe Paul himself referred to it as elastic. In the, in, in the multifold of ways that we can engage with global health as academics, practicing academics. And so I hope it's okay if I share a synopsis of where the term has taken me in a reimagination of advancing global mental health as a field by first unpacking it in relation to global mental health research and then maybe a brief mention of teaching global health and finally the interface between a well-resourced research university, not naming any names here, um, and its community of collaborators. And so I wanna start with research and I will start with a very concrete example of a multi-year school-based mental health promotion project that Bepi, Mary Kay, others and I worked on in collaboration with Per Eddy and his colleagues at Zami La Sante. The study acronym itself, TAPS, Teacher Accompanateur pilot study references accompaniment, which was a conceptual anchor with great purchase among the ZL collaborators and educators who participated in the pilot program. And this was all done circa 2010 after the devastating earthquake just outside Port-au-Prince. And we thought, you know, what better way to um, sort of be in the moment of the rising visibility of mental health needs in the area, then build on the successful PIH model of extending care into the community with community health workers, locally known as accompanators. And this in some ways was quite obvious that why we would go to schools and why we would engage teachers. The teachers had the professional skills in place to work with young people. They were invested in their well being and they had an unparalleled front row seat and longitudinal view as to whether or not they were thriving. And so this program, I'm not gonna get into any more details. It worked well enough. The students who were identified as suffering with symptoms, but who had never accessed care were reached for the first time. So in many ways that in and of itself was a success, but I wanna focus instead on the shortcomings uh, because that's where I received a large dose of education about what accompaniment is and what it should mean. And, um, I will, so I'll go straight to the very end of the study when we debriefed the teacher accompanators, the educators on their role. And I should say to Byron's point, 
in our in the very first focus group we did before this study, the teachers we interviewed said, you know, it's fine if you want to do this research, but can we just jump ahead to action? So they had very little patience for spending a long time with the research. I think that's an important tension we all feel. And they weren't wrong. So um, what we learned through the focus groups and over the process of conducting the study is that our initial framing of accompaniment, meaning what had been in the grant proposal, had not been nearly ambitious enough. And we had located it solely within the educator participant's scope of engagement. We were thinking about mental health needs. That was all we thought about. And so the teachers began by critiquing this as being you know, too clinically focused, too narrow, and really helped us understand that <clears throat> the lived experience was far more complex. And obviously to, to them and, and eventually to us, and probably already to most of you is that it, th this was compounded by extreme poverty. And there is, Vikram has already talked about the vicious cycle that the social adversities that these students lived with couldn't be disentangled from their mental health issues and really required a broader set of solutions than we'd imagined. And I just wanna quote an excerpt from one of the teachers who said, look, um, you, the, the student comes to school without eating anything. And it is from what I have in my pocket, from what I give him sometimes. This is a series, these are a series of problems that will prevent the work, meaning our work from being efficient. Another said, a hungry belly has no ear. You can't begin to solve these problems without solving the most basic needs of poverty and hunger and other kinds of insecurity. So then the, the teachers moved on from um, to our failure to extend the accompaniment approach, uh, not just to the not just to the students, but also we failed to accompany the educators, those who were who were you know to whom we were shifting the tasks. It was a task shifting model, and in the kindest, most generous possible way, they offered a round critique of our approach to task sharing. How in the world? could we arrive in, in a setting like Haiti and not realize that shifting tasks from the overworked health professionals to overworked educational professionals was not problematic. They said, we needed to accompany the teachers. How could they do their job, beleaguered as they were, if we didn't help them? So they said, you know, we showed up with food, we fed the students lunch and the students, when they followed up with the teachers were looking for lunch, but we hadn't provided those meals or those resources. So um, one of the teachers put it very well saying, instead of knowledge to accompany a student, it's really important that we have other things such as money. We say it clearly, money. So um, with the help of the ZL team, um, we learned another lesson from the study about accompaniment which was that um, for, for meaningful research capacity building, which was the jargon of the NIH grant proposal, um, we really needed to think much more broadly about, you know, beyond the technical sense of capacity building so that we could support the team in the many, many ways that they needed to be supported to even carve out the time to do this research. And that basically in the shadow of extreme poverty and need, the research capacity building was probably too narrow a construct um, to be useful. So I, um, I could say a lot more uh, about this construct in research. I won't talk about teaching, but I think uh, many of you know that in his teaching, Paul, very much adopted the accompaniment model of teaching, um, being you know sure to exercise um, uh, his his great aptitude for listening with humility uh, to the students and taking responsibility for seeing that students were successful. But I want to close my remarks by thinking about accompaniment as a principle and a practice and a set of values in the context of institutional engagement both in global mental health and specifically back to this theme of the means through which a well-resourced research university 
can collaborate and support health equity and knowledge generation, knowledge generation and health equity, and also academic equity in communities in the global south. And in my current role of overseeing academic affairs at HMS, I've had reason to think critically about how we've constructed our metrics for impact and influence. And I've been, I should thank people in the audience because they've influenced my thinking on this. And although the prevailing metrics for academia are in routine use and in many ways become, have become naturalized as a valid mode of academic evaluation, we also know they're socially constructed. And if we know that, fortunately, we also know, we should know that here at one of the least leading academic institutions, you know, we're the construction crew and have the tools to rebuild a better set. So one of Paul's books that I went back to as part of my immersion in the Paul Farmer canon is In the Company of the Poor, a set of conversations and writings between Paul and Father Gustavo Gutierrez that delve into the principle of accompaniment and its roots in liberation theology. And as several of you have said, and as Paul taught us, accompaniment is a necessary tool in responding and dismantling the structural barriers to health and undoing the entrenchment of social inequities of all types, including academic inequities inherent to knowledge production, including in global mental health. And so I would like to close by asking how accompaniment can be useful in contemplating and reimagining the moral and pragmatic position a well-resourced research university, again, not naming any names, and its faculty can configure and commit to in their role and scope of engagement in global health research, training, and service. I raise this question not with an answer in mind, but because Paul would have asked it. He always did, and he would have insisted that the conversation continue. Thank you. Thank you, Anne. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, um, I, I, I want to I wanna just move on to the last of our panelists um, who um, has worked very closely with Paul um, and particularly by, by being the leader of the mental health group at uh, PIH. Um, uh, Beppe, I was, I was uh, uh, you know, so impressed when I read, I think last week in the New York Times about the tremendous work that PIH led in Sierra Leone. Um, and this, this, this reminded me of the remarks that Byron and, and Mary Jo uh, made about their work in Indonesia. I think um, you, you know, they mentioned you know, freeing people from their chains. And it struck me that there was a real parallel in two different parts of the world with the work that you, know, you and your colleagues were doing with uh, your colleagues in Sierra Leone and the Kisi uh, Mental Hospital. Uh, anyway, I'd like to invite you, uh, Beppe, now to, to, to share your experiences. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Vikram. Such an honor to be here, and I'm waiting for Paul's commentary today and just want to say how much I miss him. And I'm going to speak about global mental health delivery. Um, you know, since the 1990s, when this department played a key role in contributing to um, the key development in global mental health at the time, the finding that psychiatric disorders constitute a huge burden of disease globally, and that mental disorders have significant impacts on disability. There's been this common thread of ongoing discourse between TB, HIV, and mental health care in the department and in our partnerships across institutions. Um, and there's been this agreement of the need to address these huge gaps through services, programs, and interventions that attend to the social as well as the clinical aspects of their source and impact. And, and of course, we've been discussing that today. And Paul did closely study mental health and the history of psychiatry in Haiti. As Arthur said, and he had a, a book chapter in 1992 called The Birth of the Clinic, The Cultural History of Haitian Professional Psychiatry. And the way he ended this chapter is consistent with what Arthur mentioned about structural violence and, and Paul's perspective. And Paul wrote that much remains to be done before the majority of Haitians with mental illness have access to psychiatric care. Even then, the contributions of such efforts may be negligible next to the forces that keep Haiti poor. These forces contribute to pathology of every description. One of the people who encouraged me to write this chapter 
was a brilliant young woman, Marie Therese, from a poor family from the Central Plateau, diagnosed by psychiatrists at the Mars and Klein Hospital as having manic depressive disorder. For years, she struggled with keeping appointments and purchasing expensive medications, only to die of infection and complications of childbirth. You see, her mother said, she died not from being crazy, it's this country that killed her. So I'm not sure I've, I've read anything since more gut-wrenching about the layering of severe mental illness in contexts of poverty. And we've had various frontline implementers from Partners in Health sites working in the department um, to describe similar phenomena in the, the Masters of Medical Science and Global Health Delivery Program that Mary Jo mentioned. And mental health care delivery is very difficult in any context, but it's particularly difficult when there are a few complementary supporting services, when one has limited training and supervision, and when the provider also lives in challenging circumstances, as, as Anne just um, addressed. And of course, culturally, mental health can also be a minefield. Paul did not want the poor to be pathologized, and uh, Arthur mentioned his studying with um, George Devereaux, and so Paul was very familiar with the history of certain strains of ethnopsychiatry um, and psychoanalysis and um, the way it was practiced during colonial times and its evolution since. And one could see how that could give one pause. And then Vikram also mentioned the binary nature of psychiatric diagnosis in the US and Europe, which also raises concern in de delivering formal mental health services um, in the global south. And I don't think Paul wanted frontline implementers to be pathologized either for their empathy to the suffering of the poor, for their sacrifices and their willingness to do whatever it takes, which was and is the mantra, one of several mantras of Partners in Health um, in building and strengthening health systems. And then the way Paul talked about the acute on chronic nature of disasters and crises on top of grinding poverty and the accumulated impact of the burden of mental disorders, it also invited different ways of thinking about crises and disasters informed by structural violence um, and the increasingly accessible ways that Paul described these forces rather than a disaster and conflict medicine approach. And so this idea of the development frame and staying in place for years, committing to building resilient systems to endure and combat disasters, rather than leading with humanitarian crisis response and the seeking of disasters to respond to, that also has benefited from a social medicine lens. So this was always the opportunity with the work at Partners in Health to actually integrate mental health care delivery within public sector systems and existing delivery structures at the same time, as Mary Jo and Byron have described in various ways, Paul led a revolution in global health education, which also impacted mental health care delivery. Um, he and Jen Fearon and Joel Katz had a 2004 Lancet piece called Global Health Equity, which inaugurated the new Global Health Equity Residency Program at Brigham and Women's Hospital and called for medicine to develop a compelling strategy um, for a more global reach. And they asked why only internal medicine? The same inequalities exist in other branches of medicine and surgery, pediatrics and mental health. So every branch of medicine has to join this movement for delivery. And as more and more people living with HIV and TB were going on life-saving medications at partners and health sites, it was increasingly people living with untreated mental disorders who stood out on the street as particularly vulnerable. And so there's also this moral calling as Vikram wrote about with Paul uh, last year in The Lancet. And over the past few decades, many people working globally in mental health applied many of Paul's ideas to their work in developing care delivery programs and training and education as well. I think another important step in the history is Paul starting the various programs in global health and social change in the department um, around 2009, which were modeled on the program in infectious disease and social change. 
Um, and these new programs across NCDs, surgery, policy, primary care, and other branches of global health intended to bridge research training and advocacy to service delivery programs. They created important career building opportunities for early and mid-career mentees of Paul's, such as myself, who were implementing delivering programs. And they also operated, as Mary Jo mentioned, within a broader Harvard partnership in global health delivery, led by Joe Radigan. Um, so I lead the program in global mental health and social change. We developed new fellowships in global mental health delivery, which advanced service delivery and academic work for US trained implementers working at the front line, as well, as well as building a new kind of career path for clinician, innovator, teacher, academics in global mental health delivery that had previously not existed. And if one's honest about the level of commitment that global health delivery requires, these are people way too immersed in the work of building teams and services from scratch in the way that Paul intended, including fundraising, to realistically be able to also carry an NIH track career, um, but who give much in terms of developing other forms of academic work that are descriptive with regard to the articulation and challenges of developing new services that had not existed before. This is like Paul's original work. And they're more grounded in quality improvement and service delivery science and targeted use of qualitative and quantitative methods as well to evaluate and strengthen the systems. And in global health delivery and mental health delivery, the mere existence of functional sustained services is often itself an innovation, which is an idea that Paul advanced. Um, and describing how to build such services is itself a worthy area of academic engagement, which is an argument that Paul regularly made. And there had been no opportunities for early career US trained psychiatrists to engage in this kind of service delivery or academic work. I also wanna mention that Paul developed clear systems frameworks to describe the processes of global health delivery, which we applied to mental health in a 2013 Lancet piece called Redefining Global Health Delivery with Jim Kim and Michael Porter. The authors describe a value chain framework drawn from economics that moves us towards a science of delivery and is based on care delivery value chains that apply systems level analysis to the complex processes and interventions that must occur over time. Um, so you can Google our adaptations of these to mental health. I'll, I'll put it in the chat, um, looking for a PIH mental health value chain, which we have on our website, as well as a service delivery planning matrix to achieve universal mental health coverage. And so we honestly have tried to have the mental health work of Partners in Health reflect to the best of our abilities, the influence of Paul's teachers, mentors, and colleagues here on this panel and here on this call more broadly, and Paul, this collaborative community that Byron described, ideas, theories, and practices that all have contributed and which have been strategically adapted and tailored to the specific healthcare systems that our colleagues across global sites built. Um, and the mental health work of PIH has sought to respond to Paul's own critiques of psychiatry um, and it also um, has integrated the growing evidence about effective task sharing of psychosocial and psychological interventions informed by researchers such as Vikram, Atif Rahman, Paul, Paul Bolton, and others. And the recruitment of Vikram to this department in 2016 reflected an awareness in Paul that Vikram's arrival would represent the convergence of several key lineages of study, research, and action in global health and global mental health. And the particular uniqueness of Partners in Health's mental health work and its origins in Paul's vision lies in its aspiration to be comprehensive, collaborative, and community-based while attending to comorbidity and the complexity of illness in real world settings. And so this has put into practice a model that values task sharing with non-specialist providers. This is the key finding of the field of global mental health over the past 15 years, but it also does so um, with these providers as one component of decentralized models 
that link communities to primary care, to district hospitals, and even national psychiatric hospitals, as is described in that New York Times article from last week. And so over the past more than 12 years in Haiti and Rwanda, we've strived to develop model programs um, that are for complex conditions in the way that Paul talked about the care of complex conditions. And in mental health, that means care for concurrent severe mental disorders and psychotic illness and common mental disorders, such as depression, anxiety, and trauma. It means community-based care and health center-based care. It means pharmacological treatments and psychological treatments, as well as psychosocial support and social support with the evaluation of these models built into the work and additional research such as that that Anne described folded in to address significant gaps. Um, and so I, um, I'll just end, you know, there's a couple things I, I could say by giving you some practical examples of this synergy of service delivery and social medicine at the front line. Um, but I, I, I think I'll end just mentioning, I really appreciated the piece in the journal Science on Paul's radical intellectual vision by Matt Bonds in this department, who writes about Paul's intellectual fearlessness and Paul as a great and complex systems thinker, not reductionistic, but constructive, integrative and radically inclusive planting seeds and trees, demanding that researchers be proximate to problems and deliver solutions, rely on direct experience, honor those who had the most of it and have the courage to be undisciplined. And Matt writes that what Paul created is nothing less than the modern global health movement. As Paul said, don't fetishize your model, be the house of yes. And I think in facilitating our work in mental health, building the platforms, articulating the theories and providing moral support and friendship, as well as lending the systems of partners in health to our work in global mental health, Paul has opened up new worlds in mental health care delivery that have yet to fully flourish. Thank you. Thank you, Beppe. Um, uh, before we, we get into discussion, I think it might be for me as well, a very uh, helpful exercise to think about how Paul's work has been has influenced my own thinking. And so speaking for myself, I need to first acknowledge that I, I started working with Paul only about five years ago uh, when I joined the department in April 2017. Uh, for those who may not be aware of this, prior to this, I was living uh, in India and working with the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine for nearly two decades. Um, I had already, though, been influenced heavily by the department, of course, by the landmark publications I mentioned earlier, uh, especially the World Mental Health Report and Arthur's uh, book on patients and healers in the context of culture. In the nascent stages of my early career, I subsequently discovered that that was also uh, the book that Paul described as his lodestar in his own early career, which was, uh, which was uh, perhaps not surprising uh, given, given the conceptual uh, ideas in that book have influenced uh, him as well as me. But I also followed that up by working with Arthur on our shared interests on social determinants of mental illness. And I hope Arthur will remember some of the pieces we wrote in the early 2000s on poverty and mental illness, and more subsequently on that, on the moral case for global mental health in the American Journal of Psychiatry. And then, of course, my memories of working with Byron, I hope he will remember, on our joint uh, effort to build capacity uh, for um, global mental health practice in mostly countries in Southeast Asia that we jointly taught along with colleagues in the University of Melbourne. But in the context of mental health care, uh, you know, much of my own work has been focused on the right to care, which went beyond the narrow biomedical prism. You, you know, Bebe, you, you mentioned the word reductionist, and I do believe that that has been uh, one of the greatest uh, challenges facing our approach to mental health care. And, and certainly in India, where I, I, I spent a lot of my work uh, before I came to Harvard, the, the, this narrow prism was, was viewed, um, you know, really reduced mental illness into what I call the three Ds, you know, diagnoses by doctors who then prescribe drugs. Uh, and it seemed a completely inappropriate, inadequate to address the phenomenal levels of disadvantages and injustice experienced by people with mental illness. So much of my work uh, before I came to Harvard, I, I didn't even know about much of the work that uh, Paul and PIH were doing. So much of my work on leveraging community resources 
to deliver psychosocial interventions, were really copying and imitating the work that other uh, uh, pioneers in India and in parts of Africa were, were, were using, which was essentially leveraging community resources to deliver essential healthcare interventions, for example, to reduce maternal and newborn mortality. In fact, a book that I'd recommend to, to, to listeners who, who would like to also read these kind of inspirational stories from a long time ago, I would recommend the book People's Health in People's Hands, published in 1994, which documents a series of case studies uh, on, on how this could be done. It is only more recently that I discovered this approach, now widely referred to as star sharing, uh, was also one that in parallel was being championed and developed by Partners in Health. And when I did discover this, I was especially captivated by Paul's framing of the role of the community health worker as accompanying. That, that is a word we've heard in many different ways today. Um, uh, but I, I'll come back to the different meanings of accompaniment that I've discovered listening to, to, to all of you on this panel. But in this context, it was accompanying a person with mental illness on their journey to recovery. And to me, this is perhaps the most important missing link in the US mental health care system today, characterized as it is by the fragmentation of diverse sectors, which are often needed to work in coordination to optimize the chances of recovery. In fact, it would be fair to say that um, the American mental health care system, indeed the mental health care systems in most parts of the world, has become a crisis care system where people bounce from one facility to the other in, in stages of acute crises or emergencies with absolutely nothing in between the crises that can actually ensure that they don't have a crisis in the future. Today, the large and compelling body of delivery science that supports the effectiveness of these approaches to psychosocial, to the delivery of mental health care, but particularly psychosocial interventions for the full range of mental health problems has laid in my mind the vision for a reimagined mental health care system in which communities that were previously labeled as being hopelessly under-resourced because for example, they didn't have enough money or they didn't have enough of the scarce specialized human resources could actually be empowered to leverage the resources that all communities have. People who care towards the tasks of mental health care and indeed more broadly, other forms of health care. And I certainly think Paul has demonstrated that uh, through his own writings and his practice and his work uh, with PIH in very many diverse contexts. The other example of accompaniment uh, I was reminded of was uh, Beppe, the, the, I think the remark you made that he really strongly believed in accompanying systems as they, oh, 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 through a deep dive and over a long period of time, as opposed to just going in briefly whenever there was a crisis. And you use a very interesting uh, you know, me metaphor, hunting for crises. And, uh, and I think that's exactly right by focusing on the long-term with individuals, with institutions, with collaborators, and with patients at every single level of the healthcare system, the notion of accompaniment seems so very, very important. I wanna now uh, turn to uh, some of the questions. And uh, uh, Anne, let me, let me start with a question to you. Uh, you, know, the, 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 you, you raised this important question of the tension uh, between research and delivering care. Uh, let, me, let me tell you, before I came to this department, I, I, I was in a traditional school of public health. Um, you know, the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine is a tremendous school. But I remember very, uh, very often this issue coming up. There was always this, this tension in the school between especially the younger researchers who perhaps had not become so cynical uh, with time saying, you know, it felt, it felt wrong to go and research a problem uh, and then to simply walk away and count your success in the form of publications. And then the more sort of, you know, as it were, the wiser, uh, uh, you know, senior faculty would usually say, look, that's the way the system works. If you want to be promoted, you have to actually get those publications in place. Um, and if you divert your time uh, in, in building systems of care, A, who's going to fund it? And B, there is no publication to come out of it. And I wondered how, how do you, how do you how do we reconcile those? Because we also work in a in a in a in a in a university system which values a certain kind of scholarship, uh, especially at the medical school, for example. So I just wondered how in your new role as well as as a, as the dean in charge of academic affairs, how do you think we're going to reconcile these tensions? Yeah, well, I, I'll I'll take the first crack at that, but I also want to invite my colleagues to to. Uh, 
register their opinions on this. I, I think about this a lot. And as Beppe knows from many long conversations in the central plateau of Haiti is, it, you know, it's, it's a challenge. I mean, Paul gave us the, uh, you know, he shared his vision, which was an aspiration that, that, you know, we would always be linking research and training and service and that it would be seamless and that there, you know, that there would be, um, uh, you know, no one wanted to do armchair global health, and we all wanted to be in the field. And yet, um, things weren't seamless. They, they're messy. And I, I don't think I need to explain it to anyone on the call that uh, the, you know, we were answerable. We have to answer to, um, to, you know, agencies who fund us, we have to put our reports in certain, you know, templates, and, um, and, and a tremendous amount of effort at least in our case, in our experience in the study I referenced, went into making that work. But that I grew to see as a, a form of accompaniment. Um, it was it was a way of, you know, as Paul would say, as his partners in health mantra is, you know, finding it, doing whatever it takes to make it work. And um, and you know, the other piece which was interesting to me is in the very beginning of the study when I. When I mentioned the focus group, when the teacher said, "We're happy to be here and answer your questions, but could we just get going already with with the work? We we, we don't need the research to know that this is going to be useful." That happened to be uh, that happened to coincide with a site visit from our NIH program officer, who made the trip all the way to Haiti, and then broadcast a webinar back to you know to sort of make the work more visible. And she couldn't have been more helpful. Uh, her colleagues couldn't have been more helpful. And they, you know, they extended all kinds of, um, you know, useful offers, ways to think about extending the research into another grant. But at the end of the day, um, you know, we, the team said, no, we, we, we don't, we can't afford the time to do more research. We, we can't afford not to act. And you may want to tweak you know your intervention a little bit and refine it but we don't have that luxury and we're we're not going to do it and you know i had to and, and and my colleagues had to ask ourselves the really hard question you know why are we in this business we're not in this business to publish more papers or get nih grants we're we're here to see that you know the work we do has value and meaning and and mitigates the suffering it redresses it in some way so that's not really an answer Vikram but that is part of the way um, I've come to live with attention and accept it yes I, I, I just to say I think this is this is a tension that I, I see in across all uh, of global health it, this is not only true in our department and I think what Paul was able to do is to create a community as somebody one of you mentioned in which this kind of impact was valued. Um, and, and I think that's not the case actually for almost all the other global health environments that I'm familiar with. Uh, I hope we can sustain that uh, in the years going forward. That's going to be one of the most important challenges uh, without a leader like Paul uh, in our midst. Um, I wanted to turn to um, you know, the broader question about the social determinants. It's perhaps we haven't touched on that uh, much in this webinar so far. One of the things that Paul wrote about a lot, of course, was on structural violence and the social determinants of poor mental health. I know many of you have also written about that. And I wonder to what extent um, you, you know, these, these, these issues apply to the crisis that we're facing in the US. Let's just for a moment turn to the domestic agenda, because I think in some part, in, in some ways, I think we'll all agree context is so very important, place is so very important when we talk about all health issues, but especially mental health. And so there will be differences between Indonesia, the US and elsewhere. Uh, and so perhaps for the sake of, uh, of, of uh, you know, getting some focus, I'd like to sort of just think about the US. And I, I think the US is an interesting case study because it has so much of, of, of mental health resources. You know, it's oftentimes when we think of, you know, less resource countries, our first go to, uh, you, know, uh, you know, problem that is that um, we don't have enough resources, but actually the US, uh, as, as I mentioned earlier, already spends more, already has more than any other country in the world. So I, I wanted to ask any of you really uh, on your thoughts about what is your sense of the cause of the rising burden of mental health problems? I don't know how many of you saw the New York Times piece. It was, a, it was an extremely moving piece, but I, I'd, I'd just love to hear, do you have any thoughts about when we think of reimagining mental health care, what do you think is happening 
at the moment in this country, especially in the last two decades, that can explain this astonishing crisis that um, these metrics show us. I invite anyone really to speak to this. Well, it's in interesting, Vikram, you talked to a group of people, none of whom work primarily in the American healthcare system um, at this moment. And that tells us something about this department. And hopefully we will have in our department in the future, more people who work locally in Boston, et cetera. Um, you know, I'll say one or two things. I'll say that, uh, one, of, one thing that is interesting, and Arthur and Mary Jo will remember this, that at the heart of the NIMH training program was uh, bringing in fellows who worked formally in American healthcare and in broadly what we called culture and, and health service and mental health services. And so we, in those years, had people looking at all aspects of, of the American healthcare system. And some of our earliest work uh, together looked at issues like, is it effective to provide housing for the homeless mentally ill? Um, and um, in what way? And, and evaluated some very specific projects um, that were organized out of SAMHSA um, on, on those issues. We, of course, had um, had wonderful graduate students um, who have worked in this area early on. Um, uh, Paul Broadwin, who has since done amazing work on the streets of, of, of Milwaukee, of uh, Kim Su, who did her PhD project uh, with us all here on the uh, American uh, mental health system. And um, so, um, on, on in particular on incarceration of women um, who, are, who were addicted to various sorts of drugs and of once they left that system, how they found their way from one hospital and to a, of another to a very really disastrous uh, healthcare mental health system as, as you describe it of Vikram and you know, I think all of these things of us watching this, um, it's influenced how we think and work in the settings that we do. And certainly one of the things, as you describe, an over-medicalized and at the same time completely ineffective or very ineffective system, um, that it um, is easy to critique the over-medicalization of mental health services. Whereas what we very often find in the places that we work is almost no medicalization. That is, I'm critiqued for focusing a lot of attention in Indonesia on making antipsychotic medications available to people who have lived most of their lives with none. And I say to my friends who are critical of quote over medicalization and pharmaceuticalization um, I part of my critique is to say if you lived in a setting and work primarily in a setting where people had access to no antipsychotic medications and had to see what it's like to live a life with no antipsychotic medications available whatsoever you would have a different kind of feeling about this so that's just one set of reflections perhaps you know, my, my, I think Byron has made some really good comments. Of course, you set it up, uh, Vikram, with your own critique. But, um, uh, uh, you know, we, I, I, I don't think we need to beat too much around the bush here. We know that uh, from Paul's own deep interest in structural factors, that those structural factors are deeply at work in the United States, where we see the income inequality inequality growing over time as the, uh, as the uh, economists pursued efficiency rather than concern for quality care. And that's an area where Paul and I um, uh, uh, worked together on the question of, um, and it was really um, his insight, um, 
that institutional efficiency had come to replace quality care as the measure of um, care, which is a, um, an unacceptable substitution because all it simply meant was that these institutions, which really were labeled nonprofit, but operated as you know for-profit, um, and that includes basically all our hospitals, um, um, really were not measuring anything related to care, but were accepting uh, economic uh, measures of efficiency as equivalent to care because they serve the purposes of the institution. So there you have your story, I think, about broken institutions. They are broken from the standpoint of, of uh, the mental health crisis and the health care and the, and, the, and the quality care crisis generally in America, but they're not broken from the standpoint of the, um, of the institutions themselves growing larger, having um, uh, uh, greater budgets and what have you. So I think that's part of the, the one part of the story. And the other part of the story was the um, social suffering project that Paul grew up in that uh, Vina Das, uh, uh, Margaret Locke, Mempele Ramfell and I had started, which um, increasingly argued that what's the point of separating health problems and social problems? They run together. But if you do that, if you put health problems and social problems together, then you begin to get findings that show you a much larger problem than the narrow epidemiology of disease tells you. And I think that this is part of the story. It's not like these problems are new. Uh, and in, on the increase, or even at the increase is new. Uh, they may have reached a larger point to capture everyone's attention today. But this has been going on for a, a long period of time. And I think if you begin to look at the social world with medicine, not just separated from medicine, and put the problems together, I think then you're seeing a much larger set of issues. So let's look at you know depression. Now we work with, uh, and, uh, and all of us have used the global burden of disease data on depression to make the case of how important depression is in the world. But the point of fact is half of those depressions don't require medical interventions. They respond, they either spontaneously remit or they respond to changes in the social circumstances of people's lives. And if you look at the sources of many of those depressions, they are social sources. Their loss of a loved one, loss of a job, loss of a, uh, of, of a community sense, loss of, uh, of, of, of self-respect, et cetera. Those, those problems, when put together with um, the, the medical, um, uh, the more medical, medically useful, approach to depression in the create a vast area of, um, of concern and have been used to argue for the importance of global mental health. But actually the argument is not just for global mental health, it's global social health is the, is the, is the big argument. And I think that uh, this is the same thing if when we look at infectious diseases or we look at uh, chronic medical disorders that, um, and that's, that was Paul's vision from the start, was that inseparability of the social and the, and the medical, denying neither one as important, both of them being important, but seeing them so interlocked, so interconnected, that um, if you took the right view, you were aware that this area was more important in terms of security than the way that our society thinks of security. This is really what security is about. It was about the failing social systems. It was about the failure of educational systems, of the, the interaction of housing and health and all the other things that make up the social world. And so I think that it's not just that the, when we look at problems, we see these as, as problems, yes, but there's an enormous advance in just seeing the problems, recognizing them. And I think that that begins to tip the scales of what we've always considered to be health. 
What is health about? Where does health sit prior, in priority in society? And I think this was central to Paul's vision that health was tied up so fundamentally with the social world that you had to both understand the, um, uh, the social causes of, of such problems, but also understand that if you're going to deal with these things, you were going to be way upstream uh, effectively. And he never lost, lost that vision. That, and, and the astonishing thing for it, and I think again, we, you know, credit should go to Harvard Medical School for this, uh, that when I um, uh, started in 1982, came back to Harvard Medical School in 1982, it was inconceivable that global health and, and, the, and the image of global health that Paul had would be at this part of what the, the school defined itself around. We got tremendous assistance from Dan Tosterson as the dean in the 1980s, Byron, Mary Jo, myself, all the others who were, Leon, who were working on this. But, but, but as, as much assistance as we received from Dan, he was not gonna stand up and say that global health and social medicine are the center of what this medical school is about. Well, that's exactly what's happened with George Daly today. That's an incredible change, um, uh, you know, an enormous change. And, and, I, and it's not just happening at Harvard Medical School. I think this is the time we're living in. We're living in a revolutionary time. We might have not have revolutionary answers yet, but we have, we understand the problems much more um, much more fundamentally. And I think this is why we appreciate now just how vast the set of issues are. Thank you, Arthur. I know Mary Jo wanted to say something, to, uh, I assume, to the same question. I'm sorry, my uh, computer just went blank. Uh, so I came out to Byron's. Um, our, when the NIMH group, of course, uh, Byron mentioned, you know, for 24 years, people are working on US issues and um, our last uh, production was um, politically uh, appropriate because it looked at issues of disparities and inequalities and of the um, problems, how problems were being solved by clini uh, clinical uh, psychiatry. And Anne was very helpful on that. And, we had, uh, we came out with a book on shattering culture, looking at the culture of uh, medicine and how it, you know, could uh, be changed uh, to deal with um, disparities and inequalities in the delivery of mental health care and, and actually train, you know, up and coming psychiatrists, psychiatric residents and other clinical practitioners and on uh, change the culture. And um, that to some extent was very well uh, supported by um, Bayer Menino, the state of Massachusetts, various places throughout the United States in which there was a, a, an, ag an aggressive attempt to um, really change what was going on in practice from a positive political sense. And I think that when you have people like Jimmy Carter, who under Jimmy Carter, you know, community mental health was something quite different than what happened under when Reagan came in. And when um, you have a discourse of from the top, from the political top addressing um, economic and opportunity, uh, economic disparities, as well as um, political disdain, I would say, uh, where you have, um, you know, people like Trump um, being at the top, you, you have, a, have a decline, I think, in, in what's going on. So we need to look beyond just the um, structure of NIH and, you know, neur neuroscience versus um, more of a social science perspective. Leon used to call the, the department, the Department of Socialized Medicine and the students would sometimes, the medical students would sometimes characterize Leon and Corella dancing across the floor in their shows. Um, 
you know, in the second year show and uh, celebrate the Department of Socialized Medicine. So from, or you know, socialist medicine. Social, socialist medicine or whatever, <laughs> you know, the thing is, it was always known as the left department, you know, ur urging people to focus and on reject, re you know, addressing the problems of, um, you know, uh, poor society, you know, um, the poor in our, our society, so, or the marginalized. And uh, so that the ideology, certainly when we came here in 1982, um, was, was definitely one that uh, wanted to focus on the, the issues that, uh, that Paul later globalized. Although everybody who came to, almost everybody who came to the, as anthropologists who came to the NIMH program had done work abroad. So they were already in a global, you know, thinking more globally as we were. You know, all of us you know, in the department had these experiences that were not just US based. So I want to just follow up, uh, you know, as we come to the end, I want to circle back to the theme of this, uh, this, this webinar, which is reimagining mental health care. We are all, all of us currently on US soil. And I, I do think that, the, 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 you know, the, the question for our department going forward is not just what we can do, I think, for global health delivery in other countries, but honestly, I'm a new arrival in this country. And I often think uh, that this country is developing when it comes to mental health. I think the, the signs are all over the streets of our big cities, uh, the prison population. I don't have to repeat the metrics. Everyone knows um, the, the state of the situation. So I'm going to ask each of you, what have you learned from your work in the global south and other parts of the world that possibly might bear relevance to how the US might in fact re-engineer its mental health care system? I want to focus on care primarily because of course the social determinants do vary enormously between different places and an author and also Mary Jo you reminded us we need to be cognizant of the social determinants, the structural factors. We need to be advocating against them, but obviously that's a different level of action to actual care delivery systems for people who already have experienced and live with a mental health problem. So I wondered whether, uh, you know, or I, I, this is a question to each of you. And, I, I, you know, this is a question that's often asked to me, what, what have you learned in India uh, or in Sub-Saharan Africa that has any bearing on how mental health care in the US could potentially uh, be, 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 be organized or, or, or transformed. And I will speak to that point. It's certainly come up in a number of the questions that have been posed to the panel. So I'd really like to end today's seminar with each of you offering your thoughts on that. Um, I don't know if there's any particular order. If someone's ready to go, then I'd love to see a hand, but otherwise uh, I'll just pick someone. Anne, you look very eager there. Let me ask you first. <laughs> I'm eager to hear from my colleagues. Uh, but this is a great question. And, um, and I will say that, um, you know, it, it, I, I do practice here in the US healthcare system. So as you ask that question, I, <laughs> my, my thoughts has, have been very active in thinking about, um, you know, it resonating with some of the themes brought up here and, and all the things that are quite broken with the system, but that doesn't mean that um, I'm going to lapse into cynicism. You know, anything but. And and I think you've you've suggested, you know, a, a very appropriately that we think about our experiences in the global south and and bring back and borrow what works. And and for starters, um, we've talked, we've heard from our colleagues a little bit about the corporatization of American medicine and how the healthcare delivery system is really optimized for efficiency. And that indeed has become the, the, you know, the clear value, not just the norm. And, um, and, and, and I think you know, everybody has heard an earful about the electronic health record and how that's optimized to, to capture billing, right? So it's billing and efficiency. It's all about um, you know, extracting value. And it, it, is the, it is literally the opposite of accompaniment. It is, it is the polar opposite of accompaniment. It is, it is basically not being present for a patient and for a patient or the community and all of the needs that present themselves as we've also heard as not you know, neatly packaged as a healthcare diagnosis. And, and I will say that you know, very few patients, PS, come with just one diagnosis, right? They come with a 
with a history and a package of health problems and social problems and family problems. And they don't want to hear, well, I'm just the doctor that deals with this and I'll write you a prescription. And then, you know, you can go home and then drive through bad traffic again to another facility on another day. We're booking out about six months. I hope that's okay for your life. So, um, so I'm, I could go on and on and, and you see, I feel a bit strongly about this, but, but what I would say is that the, um, where are the solutions? Well, the, the solutions are that, um, you know, just like in the global South, we don't see problems as only medical problems. We see the social problems and that is fundamental to the training of our healthcare providers. And it is, I, I have to say, HMS does a good job of integrating that into the curriculum, but we need to do more. It needs to be sustained through residency and fellowship training. And we need to find a way to, um, to overcome the perverse incentives to make care efficient, but not necessarily adequate and high quality. And so if, if I could borrow one principle, I would go back to accompaniment and ask that um, as my colleagues, Arthur and Mary Jo too have written, care needs to be recentered in our approach to delivering medical care. We need to equip our trainees to recognize and respond to these problems. And we need to speak back and call out the, um, what we see as the inexorable transformation of our care delivery system into basically corporate medicine. Well, thank you, Anne. Um, let me see who I'll go with next. Pepe, if you want the next person on my screen. Thanks. I, I, I was just looking for the Lancet Commission on Mental Health and Sustainable Development, which Vikram and others have worked on, because I think that that 2018 document provides, you know, some some very helpful guidance. I mean, it's hard to imagine we have 42,000 psychiatrists in the United States. We have 8,000 child psychiatrists in Lesotho, which has an HIV rate of 23 percent. There's zero psychiatrists. In Sierra Leone, there's one psychiatrist. We have seven residents. Um, and, you know, Vikram and I and Shekhar Saxena, we, we have a course called um, uh, Global Mental Health Delivery from Research to Practice. And yesterday, Vikram presented several of his own projects um, and, and was analyzing the effectiveness of mental health programming that seeks to link um, people to care and to cover care and and you know one of the the key findings is that you know finding creative ways to engage communities is an essential ingredient of strengthening mental health care and of course in the US there's many problems and um, Marissa wrote a very nice comment um, you know, seeing the sort of evaporation of community mental health systems in the US over decades and the constant um, lack of prioritization of investment. And she uh, referred to Paul's staff, stuff, space, and systems. And I mentioned earlier this value chain, this reimagining of global health delivery. Um, and, you know, part of that. Um, systems level analysis that Jim Kim and Paul Farmer and Michael Porter made, some of the core assumptions were um, emphasizing local knowledge. And I think that speaks to this community piece. And if you look at the leading guidance now globally on optimi optimization of mental health systems, um, both at the World Health Organization through the service delivery pyramid, and also in humanitarian response to the 2007 Interagency Standing Committee guidelines really emphasize, emphasizes community engagement. Um, you know, Paul also talked about addressing social and economic determinants through jobs, housing, and physical infrastructure. And we can't overemphasize enough the degree to which mental health has been sidelined. And people think you can create mental health services in ether, but delivering mental health care is actually very difficult. Um, so ultimately, I'm coming to, to effective investments. And then in the chat, I put this excellent New York Times article, and there's a video that's about 10 to 12 minutes that's excellent, which answers a good chunk of this question. 
Thank you. Thank you, Beppe. Uh, let me move on to Byron. Byron, you describe a lot of your work with people with psychosis in Indonesia. We can't hear you, unfortunately. Okay, uh, here we are. Here we are. Um, you know, I think of, and, and I think Arthur will think with me, of one of our very recent students, Ethan uh, Manolin, who has who studied one of the major reform projects in, in, the, in the recent decades of, uh, in Los Angeles, where they attempted to actually link together a wide variety of services that are available. And, um, and, and uh, that dealt with people who were immediately post-incarceration people who had have severe mental illness without housing um, and using peer support along with formal support of linking services together, et cetera. And it was able to show that these kinds of very large scale projects have the potential to do a lot of good. However, that it, that the promise of the program was to deal with a, a priority of, 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 the, of, of the state of California, which is essentially to reduce the budgets. Mm -hmm. That is, I remember when Mary Jo and I first went to the Department of Psychiatry in the University of California, Davis, in 1976, it was during the Reagan era in which the chair of Reagan, the department, Reagan, Reagan as, as governor, governor. Reagan, Reagan as, as governor, governor era in which the, um, in which Don Langsley, then chair of the department had come to build mental, to build commu a whole community mental health system but it was leveraged in large part by saying hospital care is so expensive and community-based care is much is cheaper that of course after about you know a few years into this people discovered actually it isn't cheaper to provide good quality community-based care that it actually what they did was began to expand the services that are available to a wider group of people and of course what what uh, um, what Ethan is finding is that also to the disappointment of the, of, of the County of Los Angeles, actually they're not building a cheaper system, they're just building a more effective system and that it's also costly. And the number of reforms in the United States from, from the basically the, the deinstitutional, entire deinstitutionalization movement was on the one hand kind of popularly a critique of that of the human rights issues in that system, but largely it was about cutting costs. And that to the extent that we base the building of more comprehensive and better quality mental health systems on a model that if we do it in a more integrated way, it will be less costly, often fails. And then the promises that it will be less costly, come back to bite the system. And, it, and in the end, um, we have simply a history of trying out efforts and then seeing that they actually cost a lot of money to, do, to provide good quality care and then moving on. And the kind of lack of real and profound commitment to those kinds of services that Arthur has, has mentioned when he talked before, I think. And so I just think we know that providing good quality care, whether it's by developing early intervention programs, whether it's really focusing on recovery oriented care, all of those things that are important to families, etc., cetera, um, are at odds with a system that puts people on the street into homeless shelters and, in, and into prisons and that um, and that, yes, we do know that prisons are more expensive, but we're in a corporate way committed to the prison system in a way that we seem not center. committed to the, uh, 
you know, to to the mental health uh, sector. So, I you know I think it's a long political struggle. Thank you, Byron. Mary Jo. I have uh, several thoughts um, that are not so systematic. Um, if I think about um, what I think is most impressive, I think about the importance of dignity in the treatment process and where people are held or live. And so housing that is not barred or restricted for time where you can only go in at night like shelters, um, something to do. Um, so in Aceh, when people became a bit more stable, they would allow their mental health um, patients to go and sell little trinkets or cigarettes actually, cigarettes and little toys for kids and, and snacks outside of the hospital where people who in the area would come and purchase things. And it reminds me a great deal of what happened in Italy and the importance of having an open space where people are free to come and go, but also a place to stay, a task. And it, it always captured my imagination, but I never saw it in action. The idea of patients who were stabilized living in a setting in Italy, Northern Italy, and running a restaurant, which gives dignity and something to do that is worthwhile and valued and a certain amount of freedom and some money, <laughs> the money pill. Um, and so, I, I don't know, I, this is a fantasy. I certainly didn't see great care in Indonesia. You know, no. <laughs> Actually, people who had their patients at home did, uh, who had gotten stabilized were doing pretty well, but family members were taking care of them. And there was an extended family in many cases and people were really giving up a great deal of their own personal freedom to take care of their siblings or their spouses or their parents or the kids. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks, Mary Jo. I mean, certainly what you described there, the engagement of families seems to be a very important theme. And one of the things I've I've noticed, I don't practice psychiatry in this country, but I speak to a lot of psychiatrists and I find the highly individual focus uh, almost to the fact that you almost exclude the family deliberately and explicitly seems to be something that's very different from the way I have seen mental health care practice in other parts of the world. But I want to turn finally to- May Arthur. I just say one thing though, sure. um, Vikram? We've also seen very um, awful things with families oh, in, in Indonesia where they discard their patients. They yeah, don't yeah. want them around. They don't want them delivered home, even if they're stable. Of course. And so, you know, this is, you know, not a mixed story, of course, but, I, but I'm yeah. thinking that at least there is an, a possibility to work with a family and then tailoring the family engagement according to how supportive they are. Whereas here, I think there is, seems to be almost, uh, 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 you know, the, the starting point is that this is a problem of the individual and that individual is going to be the focus of all our care delivery process. Arthur, You've written very eloquently about the role of care, and uh, you know I'd love to hear from you your your both both your personal experience, but also what you've seen in China and elsewhere in your work globally. What are the lessons that you would like to see for reframing mental health care in the U.S.? Well, um, I think one thing that age brings is humility, and uh, I, I I want to be very humble about this. But the first thing I would I learned was that. The one great achievement of the Chinese Communist Party is that in 50 years, it raised 800 million people out of poverty. That is an unprecedented achievement in our world. And during the same 50 years in our country, in the United States, 
we have not only not seen poverty disappear, but we've actually created greater disparities between health, between wealth and uh, non-wealth and, and, and weakened and diminished our middle class. Um, and so I, I think the first thing is recognition that we have a broken political system in the United States. And that's got to, you know, somehow the society has got to deal with this. Um, secondly, is that we have a, a economic system that succeeds for some, succeeds brilliantly for some. Look at Elon Musk. Today I learned he's worth $250 billion. $250 billion. So some really do well in this country. Uh, but I'd say that you know a lot of people don't do so well, and our economic system somehow has to be re-examined and reimagined. And then within that, we get to the mental health care system. And I did practice psychiatry uh, substantially here at, until I, until about ten years ago, and gave up my practice. And I'd say that you know we have got uh, a, divor a discrepancy between academic psychiatry and practicing psychiatry. I think academic psychiatry has in the last uh, 30 years contributed almost nothing to the practice of psychiatry. And I think we have very hardworking psychiatrists out there who are struggling um, to do their best and often do very well with the limited uh, um, uh, skill, with the limited materials that they have that are not much different from when I started uh, in the practice of psychiatry. And so uh, we have to really rethink uh, the relationship of psychiatry to the mental health system. As you pointed out, we have 40 to 45,000 psychiatrists in the United States. But where are they? Where are those psychiatrists? Seems like the vast majority are in Cambridge, Massachusetts and New York City and San, San Francisco, probably in Albuquerque, New Mexico or maybe Santa Fe, New Mexico. Um, we obviously have problems, major problems in distribution. And that's not just true of psychiatry. You go to rural Illinois, rural Iowa, who delivers the care, the professional care? You'd be surprised how many foreign medical graduates are the people delivering the care. And the nursing care is delivered largely by uh, um, poor women from the Philippines, from Latin America, et cetera. You, you, you look at our healthcare system in Boston for the elderly, look at nursing homes. Um, we have almost 100% turnover every year in nursing and the aides who work in nursing homes. They're the most important people in the nursing homes, the, uh, the professional aides in the nursing homes. But the job is so backbreaking, the pay so poor, the status so low, that as soon as an alternative job comes up, they're, they're gone. And there's something in our world that is changing. We should recognize it. Um, so it's not just the United States that's selfish. And we have selfishness in which people don't want to participate in family care. We, we have a lot of family care in America. But I, I was astonished in the last couple of weeks to be talking to three young Chinese women all of whom grew up as singletons in their society, and to discover that they were the most selfish people I had talked to in years um, about, they felt they were being burdened by their families calling them from China. They didn't want to think about uh, helping their families who were elderly now and needed assistance. And I realized that much that I had written about and learned about relational self in Chinese society, if the, center, the centerpiece of the family has changed that same system that raised 800 million out of poverty has broken the family in the, in, the, in, the, in the Chinese setting. So I think in the world today, we should reimagine mental health at different levels. I can reimagine it very clearly in a place like a medical school and what kind of support can we give to um, mental health in the medical school, in the curriculum, in the training, same in a school of public health. But what about in the community? And what about in the positioning of psychiatrists, where they are, et cetera? What about in the academic enterprise? So I think that what you have done is to open the door as you often do become because you're such a revolutionary figure in the mental health field. 
you've opened the door to a set of questions that makes us realize that mental health is a great topic because it connects with almost everything in society and is inseparable from so much in our society. And so I feel that this is the right time to see the transfer of intelligence and uh, interest and practice to the generation of you and Anne and Beppe. And, you know, I can only imagine what will happen in the future. It's gonna be a great future for reimagining and for, and for, and for the development of ideas. And once I retire, I will be reading everything I can to just see the great things that come forward from this department. And with and when I when, and I I aspire, my great aspiration someday is to meet Paul in heaven. And when I meet Paul in heaven, I think we'll just smile and say, "What a great department that really is." Well, here, here, and nothing more to be said. There can be no better way than to round off the seminar. Thank you, Arthur, for those wonderful words. And thank you, Anne, Beppe, Mary, Jo, and Byron for this fantastic two hours that we've spent together. It feels like a little soiree that we've had, reminiscing, thinking about our work, thinking about the future. What a terrific conversation. Thank you all so very much. Have a wonderful evening, all of you. Thank you, Vikram. Yeah, thank you, Vikram. Thank you all. Thanks, Vikram, Arthur, Byron, Mary, Joanne. Thank you. Bye-bye.